Well, uh, the conventional wisdom goes, if you're going to make it in today's world, you need to go digital. You need to get some tech working in your business, right? And while there is some truth to that, uh, today's guest is all about the fallacy behind that, the technology fallacy, and how people can make or break your systems, your technology, and everything else, and uh, how to merge the two better. Uh, so listen in on uh, this conversation about technology, where technology meets people in developing a scaling company. I think you'll find it interesting. Hello and welcome again to the Scaling Up Business Podcast. I'm your host and scaling coach, Bill Gallagher. So uh, on the show with me today is Jerry Kane. Jerry is a lot of things. I won't get it all right because he's got that kind of academic background where there's a million different seats and chairs and <laughs> <laughs> lots of hats, lots of hats. Uh, but uh, highlight, he's a professor from Boston College, right? Absolutely. And in the world of IT, information systems um, and in the business school. So the business side on of, the business uh, side, the IT side of the business uh, school. And, uh, and he's got a new book out that I thought was really cool and relevant. I see it a lot with our clients. So welcome to the show, Jerry. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So let's. Um, so we're going to talk about this business of how the, the, the real problem is often people, not the technology. <laughs> yeah. But at the intersection of the two is what's, I think, interesting. And you've got some great takeaways for folks. Talk to us then about a little bit of your background. Where are you from? How do you get into this line of work? What, what, you know, how does your brain work like that? Yeah. So, uh, well, perhaps the best place to start is like start now, and then we'll back up. You know how I got into now. Um, so my three hats are: I'm a professor of information systems at the Carroll School of Management of Boston College, and I've been teaching information systems there since about 2006. Um, ironically, my first day ever as a professor, uh, I actually did healthcare IT to start in my dissertation. And my first day as a professor was the day that Facebook launched Newsfeed. Uh, and so all my students came in to class mad um, and saying they were going to leave and go back to MySpace. Um, and I told them why. Uh, so I took, I, I call it an, an audible. And so I, Said, you know, I took off from what I was supposed to teaching and I told them why they weren't going to go back to MySpace and uh, because of network effects, et cetera, et cetera. And then about four, over the next 48 hours, a group called Students Against Facebook Newsfeed formed uh, and gathered, I think it was like 500,000 people in, um, in the course of 48 hours. And this is 2006. That was news. Um, and so that and a couple other events led me to say, hey, this social media thing might really be something. Um, so I chased that rabbit for a while, for about six to eight years. Um, and then had an opportunity uh, about the time I got tenure to pivot a little bit towards, I, I was really interested in how traditional companies were sort of trying to figure out the digital world. Um, and so uh, I started studying that in this joint effort between uh, Deloitte and MIT Sloan Management Review. And we've been, we've been studying that for about the past five or six years. Uh, we've done surveys, we've done interviews, and this book uh, is really the summation of that research. Uh, the last hat I have um, is as the faculty director of the Shea Center for Entrepreneurship at Boston College. And through that, I get to take students on trips, uh, innovation treks uh, to San Francisco, LA, Seattle, New York, Boston. And we visit companies ranging in the size of 10 employees to you know, the biggest companies in the world and figure out, you know, what they're doing with technology and how they're wrestling uh, with things. So, you know, it, it's been a really fun journey to have multiple angles uh, on this, this one problem of, of digital disruption and transformation. Yeah, interesting. So um, talk to us about the, um, let's just dive into the core idea of the of the book here and, and the research that you did to it. Maybe talk a little bit about the research and what you found and like that. Yeah. So um, the, maybe start with the title. So the key takeaway um, is based on, you know, it's the technology fallacy. Uh, so the title is the technology fallacy, how people are the real key to digital transformation. 
And really what we define as the technology fallacy, and unfortunately it never actually made it, this definition never made it into the book because we came up with the title last. Uh, we didn't think that, oh, maybe we need to redefine this term. Um, but it's the belief that just because many of the problems companies are facing are caused by technology or result from technology, it doesn't, ne- or the mis- it's the mistaken assumption that the solution to those problems will also be um, technological. And, and we don't find that to be the case at all. Um, in fact, in the beginning of the book, we use a metaphor of the Wizard of Oz. And we talk about the cyclone in the Wizard of Oz. And we say, you know, how much of the story of, of the Wizard of Oz is really about the cyclone? You know, on one part, all of it is because we wouldn't have the story if Dorothy doesn't get whisked away from Kansas to the strange new world. But on the other hand, none of it is because we don't really care about how Dorothy got there. We care about how she finds her way through this strange new world and the friends she makes, and the adventures she has. And, and we see that as the role of, of technology in digital disruption. It's the cyclone. It's causing all all of this disruption that leaders and executives and employees have to deal with, but it doesn't necessarily, but do we really care about that as much as we do? How do we make our way through this strange new world? And, and our argument is those aspects of making this journey are more about talent and leadership and culture and strategy and organization structure um, than it is about the technology itself. And and yet most people pay attention to the shiny new toys. Um, and so it, it, it's research driven. Um, we've had five years of research over that time. We've interviewed about 20,000 respondents. Um, about two thirds of them are international and about one third of them are in the US. And then we've conducted interviews with over, over 100 executives, uh, Summit, you know, cutting edge companies like Microsoft and Facebook, not my, Google and Facebook um, and Amazon, and then some at traditional companies like Walmart and John Hancock. Uh, and met life, and then some small startups and thought leaders, and it's been a really fun uh, and enjoyable journey. Yeah. So when a company like Walmart embraces technology, what happens? Well, what really impressed me about wa- the Walmart story um, is they had, as I was interviewing their chief human relations officer, she forwarded the story that basically they, re- the leadership, realized. Um, that Walmart probably wouldn't be around in 10 years uh, if it didn't change its tune. Uh, And if Fortune 1 is worried about its own uh, future, I would argue every company needs to be worried about its future. Um, And actually, what I was really impressed with is they actually – you know, put their money where their mouth was, and they really embraced this this change. And in fact, the CEO went and worked with the board, and you know, got their buy in because he said, "Look, once we start down these tra- this path, we're, we're likely going to take a hit, a short term hit in the stock market." Um, but he did, and you know, started driving digital from the top, but also making sure the, the line level employees knew what the company was doing. They made some bold investments. They're working on changing the culture. Um, you know how you turn a battleship the size of Walmart or whether you can turn a battleship the size of Walmart is still up in the air, but I've been really impressed at, at a lot of what they've done, whether it's through acquisitions, through you know, driving cultural change, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's, I, so a lot of our clients go to embrace technology. They'll buy a new system like, Oh, we read about this industry system that helps whatever. And then they'll, They'll get the system and then their people won't use it or they'll use it in a ham fisted way or they'll uh, or bad mouth it or try to sabotage it. I mean, there's a range of things like that. that uh, absolutely. Did you guys look at that? Um, we didn't look at it as much. So short answer is no. You know, more to the point we were saying we want to change the nature of the conversation Um, that in some senses, I don't want to say we don't care about the technology, but in some ways implementing the technology is the easy part. Making those sorts of behavioral and organizational changes are are the hard part. So we assume that if you just implement the technology, that's how it's going to end up because we've seen plenty of stories around that. What we're trying to say is what can you do to make sure that doesn't happen uh, and how can you do that process right? Mm. So what are, uh, so share a few of the examples. Well, and so I'm I'm trying to think. Um, So, you know, we really focus on things like 
uh, talent. You know, and, and we have some really interesting data on this that basically we ask people to what extent does their, uh, do they feel a need to update their skill set to continue to do their job? And something like 90% of our respondents said they feel like they need to update their skill set uh, at least yearly. And yet fewer than half said that their organizations provided um, the opportunities for them to do so. And that's not just training. That's on the job learning that's putting them in situations where they can develop new competencies. Um, we also asked to what extent uh, employees were likely to leave their organization within a year. And it was something like 15, employees were 15 times more likely to report wanting to leave in a year um, if, if if they weren't receiving that sort of opportunity to develop their skill set. So it wasn't that companies, employees wanted to, uh, to abandon a sinking ship. Um, what they were looking for is the opportunity to stay viable on the market. Um, and these weren't uh, young employees. They're not millennials. They're not low-level employees. They're uh, directors and VP level. Uh, so the very people organizations need to, to have. Um, and then I, you know, we have some great examples from, you know, we studied a lot of big companies, um, but like Aetna. Um, so Aetna has a traditional reimbursement program, you know, education reimbursement program. But they took it a step further and they they developed a strategic talent plan to say, okay, what are the skill sets we're really going to need in the next 10 years? And then they reimbursed their employees at three times the rate if they were willing to get uh, a degree in one of those valuable skill sets. Um, and they did an ROI analysis and found that the, you know, the ROI on this was uh, over 100%. Because they got the skills they need, employees were more loyal, um, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, that's just in some senses, that's a no-brainer. It's like, why aren't all companies doing this and developing the strategic talent plan for for growing the the talent within their own walls? You know, in the small companies, we see folks just struggling. They're struggling with growth and managing everything like that. They're not really thinking in the early stages about developing people. Of course, in our world we're talking a lot about being a learning growing organization and you can start it right from the beginning as long as it doesn't just live with the ceo or the ceo and a couple of leaders that we're pushing that down into the organization what are you doing to learning uh to learn how uh, we're creating it kind of a cultural practice and developing actual programs around it and even informal ones i like i talked to a uh, a guy in an accelerator program recently, and he said, well, we've implemented, uh, God, I forget what he called it now. It was just like a learning lunch on Wednesdays. And a learning lunch works, and this is a small team. I, I want to say they're like 40 people or something. But what happens is people sign up to teach something. So, you know, if I was a chess fan, I might talk to you about how to play chess and how to get started and like that kind of thing. So people might teach something that's very businessy or they might teach uh, something that is totally personal and people just show up and they hear and they have some lunch and that like that. But the, the result is it creates and attracts and retains a culture of learners and so shifts something whether or not it directly applies to it, which is really interesting. Yeah, two examples, you know, related examples. One were, you know, the small companies that they allowed their employees a certain amount of time. So these are software companies, um, but they allowed their employees a certain amount of time per week to work on open source software projects. Uh, because what they believed was that they these employees were going to get more knowledge that they could bring back into their own development than they were, you know, just giving it away. So, you know, creating some of that cross-boundary stuff. And then we interviewed... Um, the research and development company MITRE, uh, and they, you know, did a similar thing as your lunch and learn, except it was really built around affinity groups, um, so cyclists or cooking or something. Um, and what happened was, as employees started to interact along these um, interest groups, they actually, like, when they were cycling, they'd have business conversations, uh, and then they would create connections. Um, within the company that wouldn't exist otherwise. So they began to know who knew what uh, and and could leverage that knowledge. And I, I think your point is right. Um, and I see this in a lot of the startups I visit. Um, you know, getting culture right from the beginning is really key. And knowing what those cultural factors are that are going to keep you uh, motivated into the future, uh, I, I think starting there is really, really important because it's, it's really hard to retrofit an organization um, 
after after you've grown. Well, unless you did something to develop it, right? Intentional, right. thoughtful, design centered, then you have an accidental or a default culture. <laughs> right. But there is a culture. There's, there's culture, yeah. And that often doesn't end well. <laughs> um as you know, and that's somewhat of Uber's story is they didn't intentionally cultivate the culture. Um, and so they ended up with a bad one. And contrast that with Salesforce um, that take, you know, from day one has like, driven culture home as a really critical part and still does. And, you know, Salesforce is one of the most, you know, the strongest cultures at a, at a very large company I, I've seen. Yeah. Well, if you think about it, so. Uh, we're talking about learning and culture and creating the habits, and you're talking about technology implementation and and the fact that you've got to develop your people alongside it. It does seem like our middle mid career folks are a lot more concerned of being bypassed by technology than um, the entry level folks who want to be attached to ent- to technology technologically relevant companies, companies doing something interesting and current versus sort of dinosaur companies um, uh, who are avoiding, <laughs> right? Well, yeah, I mean, you could see, you could say, look, we're a, people are still needing to go stores. We're just going to be that. And then one day you wake up and you realize, actually, people don't. Somebody delivers stuff to my door every few hours and I never go to the store. Yeah. And, you know, one of the really interesting trends we've seen over the five years of our research that's really captured in this book um, is I have definitely seen a notable increase in the number and types of companies that are taking it more seriously. Um, And in in industries you wouldn't think of normally. Um, You know, a friend of mine was a guest speaker in my class the other day. And he does a, you know, works for a very small company that does, you're going to laugh, poultry analytics, you know, so they work with chicken farmers um, to figure out sort of how to the best feed them and care for them to get sort of to the target weights. Well, they've you know, recently implemented an AI uh, based, you know, algorithm to help, help, help do these predictions. And they said within like six months, this new algorithm has out, has blown away 20 years of, of work that they've done. And I tell my students, look, if you tell your boss, the chicken farmers are doing this and we're behind. So get up to speed. And, uh, you know, there's so many countless, whether it's health insurance, automotive, um, you know, financial services, retail, agribusiness, um, the, you, we asked the survey, we asked the question in our survey, um, to what extent do you think your industry is going to be disrupted by digital technologies? Um, and 87% of our respondents said to a moderate, that would be to a moderate or great extent. And yet we also asked them to what extent is your company doing enough about it? And only 44% said they were doing enough. So we call that in the book, this knowing doing gap, but everybody knows this is happening. We don't make a big case out of it. It's what do we do now that we recognize it's happening? And I do think we've seen, I've been pretty impressed uh, at the number of companies we see starting to take it seriously. Now, the challenge is moving it beyond just lip service to, to actually doing something. So spending some money, putting some people on something, uh, putting some current business or challenging some internal competition. Is that what you're Yeah, saying? you know, it's, it is spending money, but I'm also careful to say it's not just spending money. So we asked because it's, it's those new processes that are so much harder. Um, so we interviewed a guy named John Halamka, who's the CIO of Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Um, and we asked how, you know, how does he do it? He, for years, he's been like an innovator in his field uh, with respect to the technology. Um, and he said, you know, we asked him what his secret was. And he said, the secret was we don't have any money. Uh, so we have to we have to sort of be scrappy. We have to be innovative. We have to sort of string stuff together. Um, and we've heard that more than once, that sometimes having money is a curse um, because you throw the money at the problem, you buy the system, you think it's all solved, and you don't do that hard work of change the, changing the culture, changing the processes, making your more organization more nimble uh, and agile to be able to respond to the changes that technology is re- you know, wreaking in, in the in the business landscape. So in your, in your book, you identified some pathways, um, some distinct routes or something like, or maybe they're stages. Talk to me about that. Would you? 
Point. Yeah. So, you know, so I, I need to confess that, um, you know, this research has been sponsored by Deloitte um, and in partnership with MIT Sloan Management Review. I'm sort of the outsider that makes sure it doesn't become too consulting-y. Um, <laughs> and so when I, when I came into the project, they had this three-stage model where yeah. so companies, you know, as consultants do, it's early maturing or early developing maturing as, as companies grow. And I told the team, Okay, look, this is, as I build some cred, I said, look, this just is too much like consulting model. We need something different. So I proposed um, doing a, a culture index where we, you know, we tried to identify uh, different types of digital culture, you know, different types of culture at di digitally successful companies. Mm -hmm. um, I even had a title in mind. I was going to call it 50 Shades of Digital Transformation. Um, <laughs> and I, I saw that, you know, I thought, okay, we'd have an Apple-like company and a Google-like company and, you know, very different ways of approaching this. Did the research did the uh, statistical analysis on it, you know, to geek out for a second, we did, we ran a cluster analysis and what the cluster analysis gave back to us was in fact, um, there were three very distinct uh, cultural models or cultural paradigms uh, in our, in our research. Um, and it almost exactly mirrored our early uh, developing and maturing framework. Um, so on the one hand, I was really frustrated because I was trying to move them away from this framework and the data basically said that it was right. Um, the exciting thing was this result um, was independent of our, our, metri our metrics of a company's digital maturity. So what it suggests is that these companies have a very distinct culture and you need those cultural shifts to be able to progress. And it's things like being more experimental, being more iterative, being more agile, being more collaborative, being more risk tolerant. Um, and when companies ask, where do we start? You know, where do I start with all this? That's where I point. It's, it's like, I don't know what technologies you need to implement, but I know the cultural characteristics you need to develop. Uh, and what's really interesting is the further along these companies get, in their digital maturity journey, the more likely they are to spend the time, energy, and money to reinforce those cultural characteristics. So, what's, um, so what does it mean to be far along in the digital maturity journey? So, you know, what we did was you know, we asked them a simple question. Imagine an ideal organization that's transformed by digital technologies to, you know, yada, yada. Basically, imagine, you know, a, a perfectly digitally transformed company. And then on a scale of one to 10, where do you match your, where does your organization fit? Um, and we, if they put in one to three, you know, like far that with 10 being closest, uh, one being the farthest, one to three were early. Four to six were developing and seven to 10 uh, were maturing. Now, what's really interesting about it is what we actually saw, and this is true over five years of research, um, really the peak, like the, the, mo the ones that report the best results are those that report about a seven or an eight. Um, nines and tens tend to underperform, actually. And, and my working hypothesis there is... Those people who say we are the ideal company, you know, we've gotten it, we've we've arrived, completely don't understand what it's all about. Uh, those that really get it are saying, "Look, we're we're on this journey." Uh, you know, digital transformation is not a one and done effort. It, it's the new normal. Technology is going to keep evolving. Technology is going to keep changing. Technology is going to keep disrupting. And unless companies get into this mindset of continual learning, of risk-taking and experimentation, they can't possibly keep up. So I do think a certain level of humility uh, is essential in the face of these changes because, because what we've seen has been you know, a radical shift. And I actually think the next 10 years are even going to be more radical with the technologies we have coming down the pipeline. Yeah. Have you read the exponential organizations from Salim Ismail by any chance? Uh, I have not, uh, but I will add it to my list. <laughs> the list is always big and growing. But but Salim uh, w worked uh, with Singularity. It launched Singularity University, and he, he writes about companies getting disrupted by by other industries and so on. So the disruption of either a company who changes a business model or a technology that that makes something obsolete. Um, he talks about the pace of those things and, and what are the 
the core organizational things. But it seems like you're speaking to something that like companies struggle with. And, and it's interesting that you talk about two, the people side and the technology adoption. So the culture and people side versus the technology itself, because I, I, there's these two f- sayings that come to mind. You, you maybe heard both of them, but one of them is, you know, our, uh, I don't know if they're saying, but if what if we uh, invest in our people and they leave, right? Is the is the question, and then the the counter is, well, what if we don't invest them and they stick and around? They say, Absolutely, <laughs> right. And then I think that saying on the on the technology side, it's like, well, what if we compete with ourselves? What if we introduce something that makes us obsolete or undermines an existing revenue stream, product line, like that yep. kind of thing? And okay, but what if you don't? Your competitors, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Um, you know, on the first one of what if we invest in our employees um, and they leave, you know, if you one thing we found in our research is that if you don't invest in them, they they will leave uh, because that's one thing they're looking for. And it's not going to be the people that uh, you want to get rid of. So it's almost the reverse formulation. The people who can leave, your best employees will leave if you're not making good use of them. Uh, it's the ones that you don't invest in and don't want to keep uh, will stay. Um, and then, you know, what, look, w- one theme we have seen throughout um, is that, you know, doing this is hard. Uh, and, and I want to be clear, we're not advoc- We're not saying, you know, technology is not going to be involved in this process. We're just saying everybody's talking about the technology. The, everybody's ignoring this people side of things. Um, and I was going somewhere with that. You were saying uh, <laughs> the disrupt- investing in people, disrupting. Yeah, but what was the second one you said? Um, uh, well, oh, disrupting themselves. Yeah, um, you know, and everybody points to the fact that it's really hard to innovate while also keeping the lights on, uh, and that's just one of the challenges. Um, Jim March, this, the the uh, famous Stanford Business School professor who passed away re- recently, has a seminal paper. Um, where he talks about exploration and exploitation uh, in organizations, um, where exploitation is is taking advantage of the skill set you've got to, to drive profits now, whereas exploration is about finding new ways of doing things. And the results of that paper is really that what you want is a balance. Um, you, you need to, we know you got to exploit, but you also have to keep exploring somewhat to make sure you don't cut yourself off from new ways of doing things. And uh, some of my academic research actually showed that actually the level of ex- experimentation or exploration that you need isn't really that much. Uh, we're, what our results this year have said about, you know, about 10% is really enough to, to get the meaningful change, but far more likely what I see out there is companies really driving just the short-term things, uh, just pure exploitation, uh, maximizing their existing competencies, uh, and not thinking about the future. And you, he- I hear this excuse all the time of, well, Wall Street won't let us try new things. They demand short-term innovation. Um, and yet I see plenty of companies, plenty of public companies out there being bold and being innovative uh, and really doing the right thing for their investors. And so I think the the Wall Street, you know, going to the Wall Street short term thing is is a cop out. Um, I think everybody can innovate to a, and explore to a certain extent. And, and abs- it's an imperative uh, in today's business environment. So our listeners are probably more likely to complain about the pressure from equity partners around growth versus okay. yeah, uh, versus market. Wall Street, but yep. they're but they're they're still complaining about the same phenomenon. Like, oh, we have to focus on this now. And and in the world of scaling up, we're talking with people often about what are the key things that you need to do now that are working on the business and and dealing with addressing long important long term issues versus you know just make it to the next quarter and uh, and survive so yeah absolutely <laughs> um, and and I think it goes back to the culture you know we all have got to do things um, you know we ha- we have to keep the lights on and there's no that's not an option and we have to scale and we have to grow. Um, but again, I think if you, again, going back to the Uber example, if you focus on that at the expense of all else, um, I do think you can get yourself into trouble, whether it's not recognizing an opportunity in front of you. And we've all heard stories of successful pivots or, you know, startups really 
you know, it's not their first idea that really works. It's the, you know, the third or fourth that was the logical conclusion of the, the first. Or it's about a, a side business that turns out to be much more profitable than, than the original one. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's certainly going to be formulated in a slightly different way. Um, and, and you just have to be careful. So startups, I think, are a little more innovative um, by nature because they don't, you know, they don't have a clear track record of success and they're still figuring that out. Um, but it's important to, that when you do start to figure it out, not get completely locked into one way of doing things because you, you can find that the, the the digital carpet gets pulled out from, uh, the digital rug gets pulled out from under your feet and you want to be paying attention to those opportunities. Um, really what we advocate is, you know, what I advocate is just making sure you spend um, a, a couple days a year as senior leadership getting up to speed, uh, taking stock of the technological landscape, recognizing the threats and the opportunities uh, that are ahead of you, um, and, and make sure you're thinking long term enough. Because if you don't think, if you're not thinking ahead, it's going to and sort of skating to the puck. You, no matter who you are, you, you in this day of fast growing, fast moving, fast changing business, you run the risk of being disrupted. You know, there. Uh, I think there's a tension in um, in all companies, and I'm curious what the research says. But there's like a pull. There's certain group, and 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 it, and it may be the majority of the minority, but there's some pull within any every organization to say, just you know, keep your head down, keep doing what we've always done, don't rock the boat, um, don't draw attention. Like you know, it's conservative, it's risk averse, it's uh, it's like that. And then there's another side that is, and it, at the extreme, it's like, let's throw it all out. It's all like, it's time for something new. <laughs> and that's growth and development, innovation and new customers and new people. And, and, and neither one is really the answer, right? If everything's new all the time, we are exhausted. We don't capitalize on anything. We, we don't get a return on development and so on. And I, uh, it's funny, last week I ran into a, a dear old friend that I worked with nearly 30 years ago uh, at a company called Sprint, right? And in the early days of Sprint, it was the mashup of, well, it was U.S. Sprint, and it was United Telecom and GTE Sprint. And the United Telecom were the local phone company people, very conservative, very utility minded. And the GTE Sprint were the long distance, innovative new folks. Today, it's a it's a wireless company. It's a completely sort of different organization. But there, you could always tell there was a tension between folks who were from one camp or the other. There was a cultural war. And so it was really obvious there was a gift there. But but even in a company that didn't result from a merger of two very different companies, there's there's a battle, there's a tension in uh, in what the culture says and what's rewarded and celebrated um, in that. And and even if you're in the minority and it's innovative, there's going to be people that are like, you know, stop showboating or settle yep. down. Yeah, and so we see that as well. Um, you know. Uh, on a number of different levels. And most of our respondents reported that tension. Um, and so a lot of what needs to happen um, is, so obviously the answer is both. You need those, those two groups need to, to coexist. Um, one interesting thing that one of our hypotheses was that um, digitally mature companies would be more experimental uh, than early stage companies. And in fact, we didn't find that necessarily. I mean, we found some of that, uh, but the bigger difference was what, um, while early stage companies reported experimenting and, and having like innovation labs and things like that, um, they were less likely to do things with those experiments. Um, more digitally mature companies were likely to take the results of those experiments and then drive change across the organization. Um, and so it, you, you can have like both groups coexisting, the experimental sort of innovative folks and the more uh, established folks. But um, we do have to make sure that some of the findings, some of the insights, some of the best practices of those innovative people 
do make it over to the other side? Uh, you know, and what level the right uh, is is the right level to set that fire hose and to get that change going? Um, I don't exactly know, but it is important to make sure if you do have those pockets of innovation, well, if you don't have those pockets of innovation, create them. Um, if you do have them, make sure they're at least changing those the, the stodgy side of the organization somewhat. Uh, and that they're keeping them, you know, honest and up to speed to a certain extent. That it's being rolled out in some way. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Or just being allowed to exist in its own little pocket and it never affects the core business. That doesn't do any, that sort of uh, innovation theater um, where, you know, we, ooh, look at our lab, look at our innovation stuff. No, it doesn't actually affect our business at all, um, but we have it. Um, and that's really, I think, where a lot of companies run into problems. Well, you know, so I um, I tend to work with companies from, well, I see some companies in, in our uh, early stage companies in our workshops and in our accelerator programs. And those can be, you know, from zero to, 500, 5 million or something like that. And then the core companies we work with maybe are more like uh, 40 million in average, and but range from like 10 to 500. And what I notice in those environments is there's not really the having somebody dedicated to innovation is not pegged to the size of the company. At, at some of the large ones, there isn't somebody in or any functional thing in charge officially of innovation. It just happens at different parts of the company by different people. Um, and, and then, but at some of the small ones there, there is, and it doesn't seem tied. I, I see it in both cases, but we stop and we ask who's got learning and the development of people versus just the admin and hiring side of things. That's almost never covered. And the, the folks with a, with a focused effort, a conscious effort on that R and D or innovation is pretty small um, in comparison. That that there's just not that, and almost the ones without the programs are implementing things more than the ones with the the lab like functions where it may live like oh that's Bob's thing and he he he's the mad scientist over there. But you see a lot of his things don't get pushed out in the organization. Right. Um, and uh, to be fair, in our research, the companies that we saw um, struggled the most uh, with digital disruption are those mid mid-sized companies. Um, because the smaller ones are nimble enough that, and, and often new enough, uh, that they can, they can respond more quickly. The huge ones just have resources to throw at the problem. Uh, it's those, that, those mid-range companies that really need to be innovative in the way they approach this problem. Um, and, you know, we've seen things like maybe you don't have somebody dedicated to uh, R&D, but maybe you do, you know, one day a month, you know, working with a, uh, a mid-sized agribusiness company, uh, and they did an internal hackathon once a year with their employees, um, got, got them to work on a project. And, um, you know, this is not a, a huge, glamorous company, but they're really trying to keep that entrepreneurial mindset alive in the company. And that, I think, is is what needs to happen, is you, you don't want to lose that as you get to that midsize stage. Well, it does seem like it's not always – I mean, clearly – uh, the Googles, Apples, Facebooks are doing new things and working in new ways and challenging things. Um, but there's a whole host of companies that you haven't heard of that are doing stuff. I think you talk about um, Harley Davidson, don't you? Yeah. What did you see there? So, yeah. So um, we were able to interview the CIO of Harley Davidson. Um, and, you know, we were asking him to explain um, one of our findings. Um, so one thing we found was that um, digitally mature companies were more likely to organize according to cross-functional teams. Um, yeah. And those cross-functional teams, this year's research is showing, they, t they also tend to be managed differently. Um, they tend to be managed, uh, uh, given more autonomy to accomplish their goals. They tend to um, be evaluated as a unit, not as you know distinct individuals. And we asked him, you know, why... Why do you organize that way? Or what is this result? And he said, we found the same things, um, that basically digital is affecting all aspects of our product. And if we don't start thinking about it in a unified way, we are never going to be able to integrate it into a unified way uh, in our 
in our team mm-hmm. or in our in our product. Um, mm-hmm. We also talked with CarMax. I don't know if they can be considered a mid-range company for you. For sure. Um, yeah. And so they organize according to these pro- cross-functional teams and, and they report that it allows them to be more agile because these cross-functional teams are working on different objectives and they can be more easily pivoted to address new concerns. They evaluate what the teams are doing, reassign um, a- as they go. It just that team-based structure allows them to be more more flexible and agile in the marketplace. Um and then Freddie Mac, which was the third one we talked to about this problem. Um, and she said, you know, we organize according to cross-functional teams because if we don't organize differently, we're not going to think differently. And really what we're trying to do is drive a different way of thinking across the company. And these cross-functional teams gets different people from different uh, silos to be, to be in conversation with one another. Yeah, and maybe make the ideas better, right? When we work on on process improvement in companies and we identify that one of the ways that regular operations go off uh, is with processes that break down, it's usually in the handoffs between departments and, and functional areas. So we'll identify processes that span departments, functional groups, and then I and then establish a, a, an overall owner for it, name it, give it metrics, uh, and then go to work on various types of process improvement, whether it's mapping and uh, lean work like that, uh, developing checklists, all uh, the whole world of that stuff. Uh, but from that often come interesting innovations, whether it's applying a software tool uh, of some kind or simply changing up the process, reimagining something or a combination of technology and process change. We're getting that. But the, those ideas that may start with one person get profoundly better when a, a cross-functional team is contributing to them, right? Absolutely. Uh, and then the key is with these innovations uh, is make sure you start small. Um, so we talk a lot in the book about agile software methodologies and how that can be moved into organizational transformation. And, you know, it's about experimentation. It's about those those quick wins and those minimum viable improvements um, that then when they work, you then begin scaling them up. Uh, and so keeping that innovation in mind, and, and you can do that in teams because if a team fails, uh, it's not a big deal. If an enterprise-wide system rollout fails, that's a real problem. Um, so, you know, the team structure, you know, can enable this risk profile. And one thing we saw that was interesting, one of our respondents said, you know, we have our, whatever our, our failure, target failure rate of whatever, 5% or 10% or whatever. And he said, the real risk is that we we're, we're, we're safer than that. And whenever we don't fail at least five or 10% of the time, we up the risk profile of our efforts because that means we're not being, we're not being uh, innovative enough or we're not pushing. If we're fail, if we're succeeding hundred percent of the time, we are not nearly being innovative enough, which I thought was a really refreshing sort of angle. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is something that I get asked about a lot is what's the balance. And I'm like, well, if you're failing at everything all the time, uh, it's depressing, <laughs> right? Teams can't only take that much. But if you're winning at everything all the time, it's a little bit like the participation medal. You're like, yeah, okay, we're green again. Like we expect to be green. And then and then you're not growing, you're not developing. It's all a little too safe. So it's that tension of like, well, what percentage is it? I don't know. Yeah, Are you willing to say fail at 20% of things if you accomplish 80%, right? Yep. Are you well, willing to miss it- a few? You know, and it, this goes back to the venture capitalists I've talked to. It depends what those wins are. You know, what what game are you playing? If you're playing a game of 100x, you know, talk about scaling. If one of these innovations is going to lead 100x, 1,000x growth, then by all means, get risky. Um, if they're going to be smaller ones, then, you know, you adjust your risk profile accordingly. Yeah, so evaluating the risk reward side of it, and because I'm sometimes you just don't know, right? Like, who, who knows? It feels like it's about here. But. Yeah, well, and then you, you know, and then if you're wrong, you reevaluate, you know, and so you. Yeah. It, this is a, this and- this can be a moving target. If you're failing twenty percent of the time, and you're finding that that is not getting you, or let's say you're failing thirty percent of the time, and you feel like that's not getting you where you need to go, then okay, maybe attack a little, you know, one, figure out why you're failing that much. Is it because, I mean, it's easy to fail. Uh, you know, we people just didn't show up to work. Well, that's why we failed. Uh, make sure you're, you're learned. So one thing we learned from Google 
is they run experiments all the time and they said, we don't care if it succeeds or fails. Um, you know, Google has that luxury because they have more money than they know what to do with. Um, but what we care about is what we learn from it. And I think the key with those experimentations is make sure you know why you're failing and frankly, why you're succeeding. Um, so you can learn and do business better and different. And that, that, culture of continuous learning is not just amongst the mindset of the people, but it's also at the organizational level too. How does your organization structure in a way so that you are continually learning? Because, because the digital environment keeps changing and we have to keep learning because, because the, the rules keep changing. Um, and so I think this is just, this is the new normal about what it's going to be like doing business in this day and time. So here's what I'm getting is that, uh, that we're all focused on digital transformations, uh, bringing tech into our companies, building tech companies. But along the way, we have to remember that the people, it's people that use the tech, that interact with the tech, that select the tech, that cause it to win or lose, and that it takes at least an equal amount of energy on that side of things to work uh, that and to, to remain competitive. I will take it even a step step further um, yeah. because I will say we do not care about digital transformation. We care about business transformation in response to digital trends. Um, and those are two very different questions. A, a great example recently is Best Buy, um, who responded to th digital threats from Amazon by becoming more customer centric, by doing showrooming, by you know, they didn't do digital stuff. They just realize with their product, they developed the product set where their at their strengths uh, could be emphasized, um, and so an effective response to digital disruption is very different than using technology to change business. And I think, uh, no, it, it may involve technology, but what we really care about is business response to digital disruption, not digital transformation of the company. Right. So there, so Best Buy is still relevant for those of us who have a Best Buy, uh, it, because we may want to go see something, physically look at it and evaluate in person, talk to somebody who actually knows something about it. Uh, in some cases, you want something fair, even more immediate than Prime Now can send to you, depending on where you live, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Best Buy model isn't the, the only way to go. Um, you know, we saw with Aetna, you know, their response to digital disruption was to develop this talent model to make sure their employees were getting the right skill set. That's not digital. Um, and so the whole point is we're so fixated on the technological solutions that we, we've, and that's the technology fallacy, book plug, um, that we forget that you know, what we care about is getting our businesses able to operate in a digital world. And so much of that has nothing to do with technology, using technology at all. It's about being able to be more nimble, adaptable, um, experimental, iterative. Um, those are more important than, than most of the technological platforms out there. Now, sometimes to get there, to be more nimble, agile, responsive, you need a digital platform to make that happen. But the business goals come first. Yeah. Well, that's a, a beautiful summation to end it. The book, uh, Digital Fallacy, Jerry Technology King, Fallacy. Sorry. <laughs> Technology Fallacy. <laughs> well, one of my, one of my interviewees called the the the, te the Technology Fallacy, and I said that's a very wrong uh, reading yeah. of that. I like should have it right in front of me, right? Um, so Gerald Kane, Jerry Kane uh, is the other. If you want to find out more uh, and connect with uh, with Jerry, there uh, you'll find him at uh, Prof Kane, P R O F K A N E dot com, Prof Kane, and you can find a link to the technology fallacy and and your your contact info and your work and that kind of thing at that. Absolutely, your fine photo at your website there. Well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, so profkane.com. And we'll, of course, the link will be in the show notes so you can get that right. Awesome. Um, we're here every week. So uh, with some topic, author, guru, CEO, somebody to share something in the world of scaling up, growing your business, uh, you'll find 145 or so back episodes 
Uh, we have workshops uh, all the time. Get all that stuff at scalingcoach.com. So go find something on virtually anything that you are grappling with right now in our back catalog of, of podcast episodes and our blog posts, um, as well as free tools, work, uh, worksheets and things like that to do with the scaling up framework and, and getting your company scaling smart. Uh, so scalingcoach.com, go find us there. Uh, and uh, you can subscribe anywhere that you get your, on iTunes or wherever you get your uh, your podcast from. Uh, if you loved it, share it with somebody else along. Thanks again, Jerry. We'll talk to you all next week. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Well, I want to give special thanks to the original growth guru, Vern Harnish, author of The Rockefeller Habits, Scaling Up, and host of our summits. Uh, this show is produced by Crystal Carson, and the audio production is done at Podfly Productions, with the audio editing by Albert Burge, and show notes compiled by Ein Codina, with proofreading by Tim McGowan. If you got any value out of today's show, please share it with somebody else so we can spread the love around. Uh, like it and subscribe so you get next week and every week's episodes uh, downloaded right to you. Uh, wherever you get your podcast, iTunes, Stitcher, wh whatever works for you. Uh, you can, of course, find us and our whole back catalog of episodes like this at scalingcoach.com, where we not only have that, but also loads of downloads of free tools. You can get a copy of the Scaling Up book. Uh, just pay the shipping and handling, and we'll give it to you. Uh, if you got some value out of today's show, please, uh, please share it. Um, thanks again for listening. Keep scaling up. Keep scaling up.